something that is so, I think, um, important because women's health is probably most closely connected to the cycles of nature. There are circadian rhythms, light, dark cycles, that Western science is now beginning to understand as the most important part of Western medicine. One study in Scientific America recently said that the next system of revolution that will revolutionize medicine as we know it is this thing called circadian medicine. Thousands upon thousands of years of Ayurveda have talked about circadian medicines, living downstream with the natural cycles. Are you in sync with the natural cycles? There's a thing called genetic noise, where our cells, literally the genes within our cells, don't hear or listen to the circadian clock anymore. In other words, we're supposed to eat during the day and sleep during the night. Our women have monthly cycles that are connected to these light, dark cycles as well. And the lunar cycles, these are, cy are cycles that the very first cells on this planet, according to the new science, had connections to these circadian cycles. So the very first primitive cells on this planet were connected to these light, dark cycles. So it's pretty ingrained in our genes that we stay connected to those rhythms. And if we lose that connection, well, bad things can happen to all of us. And I think for women, because they, they tend to have this, this monthly cycle, which really locks them in or out of those cycles, it becomes uh, a, just a great discussion for us to have about what these cycles are and remind us all that how important they are. You know, when women get out of whack and they get out of balance, a lot of things happen. PMS, painful periods, uh, yeast infections, libido uh, becomes an issue, vaginal dryness, menopausal issues, hot flashes, infertility, miscarriages, uh, postpartum depression, um, you know, cysts or lumps, or polycystic ovary, ovarian issues. There's so many topics that relate to this, and I want to talk about uh, a little bit about all of these tonight, but I also want to talk about some of the underlying causes that could uh, be involved here. And a couple of them are, number one, what I want to talk about in detail right now, which is circadian medicine, but congested lymphatic flow, your ability to digest and detoxify well, your diet, your stress levels, overdoing anything, um, and um, depleting this crazy thing Ayurveda calls ojas, and we'll talk about that. That's sort of my goal for tonight, is to talk about that. And if I have time, I wanna talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> menstrual health for each different body type, vata, pitta, and kapha body types. I've got articles that I can send you to to read about that, but I wanna talk a little bit about that. And definitely talk about breast health and breast uh, preventative health. So here we go. Um, circadian medicine, there are these beautiful cycles in nature that we have to follow. When I uh, first came back from India in 1986, and I was running Deepak Chopra Center uh, in Massachusetts, we co-directing this center, um, Ayurvedic Center. We had Ayurvedic doctors coming on a regular basis that I would host and travel around with them and, and doctors that I trained in, in India with and really got firsthand information about, about their take on the American culture. And one of the, on a number of occasions, some of the Ayurvedic doctors would ask me, you know, why is it that women in America have so many menstrual or reproductive health problems? And um, I had no idea at that point in time, I, you know, from an Ayurvedic perspective. Um, and what they, what they all seemed to feel, um, have a consensus over was the fact that women have lost their connection to these natural cycles of nature. And here it was three months ago, maybe, Scientific America writes an article saying that the, the next revolutionary system of medicine is gonna be called circadian medicine, teaching us how to reconnect ourselves to the natural cycles, the clocks that live in every single cell of our body, and how we've disconnected ourselves from those clocks, and how important it is to stay in rhythm so we can actually hear these beautiful cycles. These cycles, by the way, come from the earth. And the microbes that make up 90% of the cells in your body also come from the earth. And those little microbes climb out of the, climb out of, of the, of the soil onto certain plants. And they have a <clears throat> symbiotic relationship with these plants. The plants love them. The bugs love the plants. And they become 
very much a part of the intelligence of that plant. And when we harvest that plant in season and eat that plant, those microbes on that plant become our microbiome. And that's designed to change every season, every cycle. We get certain microbes that help us digest better and boost immunity in the winter, get rid of mucus in the spring, and help get rid of heat in the summer. These are powerful, powerful messages we're just beginning to understand that Ayurveda had some very profound sense that this was extremely important to connect up with these natural cycles of nature. I, I just think it's fascinating how much they knew. So the natural cycles, what they said was that women, it's a very delicate subject, so let me try to do this um, properly. Women have a natural cycle. The lunar cycle, when the menstrual cycle happens, is an internal cycle that is moving energy down and out. We, and that's moved through one of the pranas or life forces called apanavata, which goes down into the pelvis and removes waste out. We have another prana that goes up into the head called pranavata, gives energy, vitality, mental clarity. And these are the two major pranas in the body. And if you overdo with a lot of stress, taking on too much, working too hard, ex doing excessive exercise, excessive work, excessive anything, then this prana energy is not going to be enough to handle all the stress that we are enduring. And the apanavata, which goes down for menstruation, reproduction, elimination, it oftentimes goes north. It's sort of the adrenal energy, that downward moving energy. And if that is going north to support you know, all the different activities that we have to do during the day, then oftentimes the menstrual cycle will show up as a weak link or say, hey guys, you know what? All the energies over there are doing 90 mile an hour things 24 seven, and I don't have enough energy to menstruate with, so we're gonna actually show some signs of weakness. So there may be some menstrual concerns that begin to take place as a result of that. So these two energies, the prana that goes up and the prana the apana that goes down, have to be balanced. So during the menstrual cycle, this energy is going down. Now, if you're still doing 90 mile an hour and things all day long, then this can be a problem. When I, when I uh, used to work with a lot of professional athletes years ago, I wrote a book called Body, Mind, Sport. Uh, Martina Navratilova did my, did my uh, forward to that book. And she said clearly, says, John, when I have my menstrual cycle and I'm playing a tournament like Wimbledon or whatever, I'm, I know I'm not going to be on my game. In, you know, because during this time, I just don't have that, that outward energy. Well, that's exactly what Ayurveda predicted, that the energy is going inward. It's going down and out, not designed to go out and about. Personally, I think everybody should have a menstrual cycle to teach us to go in, to reconnect with our true selves, to find that place of peace and calm, to hail from that, that place of love uh, and calm and composure and function from that place. This is a law of nature. You know, the sun sits still and silently as everything spins around it. Nucleus of atoms sits still and everything spins around it. Hurricanes have an eye and the wind spins around it. This is a law of nature. It's called in Ayurveda called the coexistence of opposites. That means that we should be able to be dynamically active and calm at the same time. But if all we live is dynamically active, dynamically active, dynamically active, we don't reinstate, reinstate the calm, we lose the calm, we lose the source of our being, we lose the source of our full human potential. This idea that there's a coexistence of opposites is a, is a formula for human potential. I wrote my first book, Body, Mind, and Sport, because I was so fascinated by the runner's high, the zone, where athletes had these peak experiences. And it was always my best race is my easiest race. Billie Jean King, who did the forward to my book as well as Martina, she said that I would transport myself beyond the turmoil of the court to a place of total peace and calm, as she would be winning Wimbledon or some Grand Slam tournament. You know, and the idea was that that she created this eye of the hurricane, this calm, and then from there she could be dynamically active. And from that place there's a balance. And, and I read a whole book about how to do that athletically, which is fascinating. But I also, our daily routine, our connection with the natural cycles, the light, dark cycles, our rest and active cycles, winter, summer cycles, our, our rest and active cycles. You know, there are times of the month where there's resting cycles and active cycles. So the idea is that during the monthly cycle where women are menstruating, the apanavata is going down. And if this energy is depleted, 
then the body will borrow money from the pranavata to support menstruation and leave nobody home in the pranavata. And you'll notice that. You'll feel tired or lethargic. You'll have PMS or feel emotional. So this is what happens during, from the Ayurvedic perspective during the menstrual cycle. If you're pushing, 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 pushing too much and all the apanavata that should be down for reproduction and elimination is north to support all the activity you have in your life, then there will not be enough menstrual apanavata to support menstruation. So when that cycle happens, this energy will move south to support that, leaving nobody home and you feel depressed, tired, lethargic, maybe uh, depleted, emotional, things like that. In addition, so what a lot of Western suggestions are for that is to just exercise and that will help make your cycle uh, balance your cycle. So listen to this carefully. The reason why you potentially have a PMS tired, exhausted, emotional tendency during the cycle is because you're a little bit on the overspent, exhausted side. The pranavata is depleted. It's all down here trying to support menstruation and there's nobody home up here. So if you exercise, you're gonna stimulate more energy back up into the head and you will feel better. There's good science behind that. But did we just borrow from Peter to pay Paul to drive us further into debt? Wouldn't it be smarter for us to say, hey, what if we actually just pay off that debt down there or pay off my overall debt of being exhausted and depleted and just way I don't have to borrow from Peter and Paul from in the first place. You follow me? So what happens is we end up creating these strategies to solve the symptoms of PMS or menstrual sort of issues, but we never really solve the problem. So the Ayurvedic doctor said that women don't take rest during their cycle. Now, this is a very kind of politically controversial issue to say that women should just rest during their menstrual cycle. It tends to be perceived here as a sign of weakness. I'm not saying that women should take rest and stop their lives. And, and in India, uh, a lot of very maybe archaic things happen where women are, you know, you know, uh, put into uh, tents and uh, away from the community when they're menstruating. There's a lot of very weird old things that I think happen, but they're premised on some good sound logic of what's happening energetically in the body. And I think the bottom line is do what you feel. If you're feeling during your cycle a little bit more inward, a little bit more withdrawn and a little bit more silent and quiet and introspective, or introverted, then that would be a good kind of thing to follow up with and give yourself time to do that. Now, if you have a job and a life, you can't do that, but you can sure schedule around major events and not schedule a marathon or a run or a triathlon during that event or an extra trip or a travel trip. Whenever you can, you can try to do your best to schedule around it. That would be one thing that you can do. So it's important to, to realize what's happening on the, on, the, on the energy level. And if you feel fine, that's great, but still know you know, sort of in a preventative sense, that these are the energies. We only have so much energy in our body. Our adrenals are little tiny, little tiny glands. They're, they're not brilliant. They are told by the brain, I need more energy, I need it right now. And as a result, the adrenals just make more cortisol to fight more stress and, and create and, and, and drive you further into a depleted state or an exhausted state. Now, this is where the problems become a little bit deeper. So the Ayurveda, got, it's a recap. The Ayurvedic doctor said, women don't respect the cycle. The cycle says, rest, let the energy go down, and women are going 90 miles an hour. I'm not saying to not do things, but I'm saying there's a power and a value in reconnecting with the calm. You know, there's an old saying in Ayurveda that says, do less, accomplish more. And it means sort of like, you know, my best race is my easiest race. Uh, that ability to be calm in the midst of activity, to go in the flow with the current, downstream with the current. You're not paddling upstream against the current, feeling exhausted at the end of your day. Do less, accomplish more. There's another old saying in Ayurveda, which says, do nothing and accomplish everything. And this is what the sun does. Sun sits still, doesn't do a whole lot except be itself and look at what it created, everything. So the idea that we could actually be ourselves, do nothing, like don't be the doer of a whole bunch of stuff, do nothing and accomplish everything is an incredibly crazy concept. I get it. I'll spend the rest of my life trying to figure out what really that means. 
but there is something, and maybe you've all tasted it, where sometimes you're in the flow and you're just, you're, you're, you're just so balanced and you're accomplishing so much from that effortless place. That's the runner's high. That's what fascinated me in the very, very beginning, got me into Ayurveda, and still, you know, still you know, drives me to, to understand it deeper every single day in my practice. This idea that we can create this calm and hail from that place and not be depleted and exhausted as a result. I really believe that that's there. I believe that's what the menstrual cycle is truly about. It's a reset. Personally, I believe in matriarchal societies. I think women should govern because they have this natural ability to connect and go deep and govern from a place of peace and love. Men are out there trying to you know, shoot animals and whatever. Yeah, and they can do it, maybe, but it's a different program. Women are connectors. And that monthly time is time for them to connect. So look at, I look at that as an incredible positive opportunity, not that I did to do it, but I really think it's a great opportunity that we ignore. And this was what the Ayurvedic doctors told me 30 years ago now, maybe. And, um, and now we're seeing that circadian medicine, which is suggesting that our genes can't even hear the cycles of nature, is the new cutting edge of Western medicine. So, uh, call it Western medicine catching up, whatever, but, it, but there's some logic behind it. And I think that's where this talk stems from, is to say, hey, how can I take a couple of days, a day off, a half a day? Can I take it easy, not take on a huge schedule today, not take on extra projects today? You know, just navigate around those four or five days during your cycle to take at least, a, you know, a half a day or here, an evening here, you know, and, and try to just reconnect, meditate more. He's not exercise so ballistically during that time of the year. Let the energy go down. So here's what happens now. In our bodies, when you're under a lot of stress and you have all this activity, 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 and no silence to balance it out, the adrenals, little tiny glands, they produce more cortisol and they run out of gas. We've all heard of adrenal fatigue, right? That's like, you know, the buzzword, I have adrenal fatigue. Well, what really adrenal fatigue is, is taking on too much and your adrenals can't make enough cortisol to keep up. When the, and so the adrenals, they don't just stop making cortisol. It's not their thing, okay? They go borrow money for a long time first. So what they do is they go borrow money from your, adre from your uh, reproductive system, from your blood sugar, from your thyroid. So they start scavenging energy from wherever they can. They will go to reproduction and they will rob the progesterone, which is a natural precursor to cortisol, to help make more cortisol. So progesterone levels will naturally, sort of not naturally, but unfortunately, get depleted when you're under a lot of stress and you're going 90 miles an hour 24 seven and you're really depleted and exhausted You'd, and your body will start to usurp progesterone, particularly if you're not pregnant or getting pregnant or whatever, the body will say, well, gosh, you're not really using it right now. I could use that progesterone to make some cortisol to help fight this crazy stress that I have in my life. So I'm going to go do that. Progesterone levels begin to deplete. That leaves us with a perceived, the body perceives that as high estrogen. Estrogen doesn't convert into cortisol, so it stays there. And then you have all the estrogens in the environment that make estrogen the perception of high estrogen be even more. So that creates ups and downs and moves and the tendency to gain weight. Testosterone is another precursor. Women have testosterone, not just men, that is used to, to convert into, uh, into cortisol to help fight the stress. So a lot of women find their testosterone levels becoming depleted, therefore no sex drive. And a lot of men or women also have their progesterone levels becoming depleted, all both of them disturbing the ability to either menstruate regularly, have a healthy uh, menopause process, um, uh, have the sex drive that you need, and to be able to get pregnant and stay pregnant. All that happens. Now, let's talk about pregnancy for a second. Pregnancy requires sort of this chemistry in the body where I'm nesting and I'm safe, and I have a safe place to have this baby and nothing's gonna attack my baby. It's a nesting chemistry. It's not a life-threatening survival chemistry. So if we wanna get pregnant and stay pregnant, one of the first things you wanna do is convince your body the war is over, life is not an emergency. And if your life is a full-blown emergency 24-7, all the apanavata is up here north fighting all the battles, and there's no energy here to menstruate, eliminate, or process waste as efficiently as you could, well, then it's gonna be more difficult for some women to get pregnant, you know? So, and, I, and I, it's sort of interesting, you know, I, I have t uh, treated over the many years, many, many women who complain of infertility, 
I had uh, many, many miscarriages. My wife, if you know if you read the article this morning, um, had a series of miscarriages, and, and that's a great article to understand sort of what I'm talking about now. Um, but the idea was that that many um, women have a lot of these menstrual issues because they are, uh, you know, super depleted and super exhausted. So if we can actually pay off the debt, then we can get through these menstrual issues and pay back some of the exhausted debt. So the hormones, the, the testosterone and the progesterone, they become uh, depleted and, and the adrenals just keep driving away, making more of these stress-fighting hormones. And this cortisol just stays higher and higher and higher. And cortisol levels that are high cause a lot of stress. They cause a lot of damage. They're such a degenerative hormone. It doesn't let you sleep at night. It causes a lot of problems. It can cause high blood sugar issues. It's sort of responsible. It's basically stress being responsible for a lot of problems. So we want to think, you know, before we just say, okay, I'm having some menstrual issues and I want to go on bioidentical hormones, you know, Ayurveda is against that. You gotta remember bioidentical hormones aren't 100% natural. They're not 100% botanical. They're half botanical and they're half synthetic. So are they 100% safe? When we had things like Premarin and back in the old days, um, those hormones had some severe problems. They were all synthetic. So does that mean that, that um, that these are 100% safe? I don't think anyone really knows yet. I think they're way safer than they used to be, and I'm not completely against them for short periods of time, but I think the first thing to do is try to understand why my progesterone levels are low in the first place. Maybe my progesterone levels are low because I'm under a huge amount of stress, and my adrenals borrowed the progesterone just to, to, to make more cortisol. That's what they do. So instead of just giving my body more progesterone, and calling it a day, why don't I deal with the reason why I'm borrowing from Peter to pay Paul in the first place? And this is the part of Western medicine I don't quite understand, that we think just because you take a blood test and the progesterone levels are low and testosterone levels are low, and you just fill up the tank like it's a gang, like a gas tank, and we're going to solve all the problems without understanding why it went low in the first place. I just don't quite understand the logic behind that. I think, as you can all imagine, the body is way more complicated than just, uh, you know, a gas needle that says it's low, fill it up. So this is something that we have to say, well, okay, well, here, here we go. Cortisol levels are, uh, or cortisol levels, the adrenals are depleted, they borrow from progesterone, they borrow from testosterone, let's fix the adrenal of fatigue and exhaustion. Let's get the lifestyle back into balance. Um, and that's the apanavata and the pranavata that we talked about. These little adrenal glands aren't so, aren't so brilliant. They also are gonna go to your blood sugar and they're gonna say, hey, you know what? I don't have any cortisol here. I'm really feeling depleted. So the brain pulls down the menu and says, how can I get out of this crazy hole I'm in right now? And that's going to be things like sugar and candy and coffee and stimulants and shopping and all these reward-based dopamine kind of things we've talked about in the past. The brain just says, go after it. So now it's next thing you know, we're stimulating ourselves with sugar and breads and carbs. And of course, we have a culture that's been feeding us carbs forever and ever. So we're really very conditioned to want to go after carbs, which creates highs and lows and energy, gives you the energy, you feel great, but what goes up must come crashing down. And when you crash down, the adrenals go, oh my God, I'm even more depleted now, so I gotta borrow more money. And then what goes up, you feel good, but then you come crashing down. Now you're more depleted, you gotta borrow more money. And most folks, not most, a lot of folks find their life on this roller coaster. Many of their, most of their time on the way to feeling good because we just ate something yummy and sweet and tasty and then you feel good for a very short period of time and then you find yourself crashing on the way to feeling bad. Then you feel really bad and then you crave, desire something to feel good again and you take that cup of coffee and then you're on your way to feeling good again. And, you know, and the, the peaks are very small and then you're on the way to feeling bad again. So most people are on the way to feeling good or on the way to feeling bad, on the way to feeling good, on the way to feeling bad. A, most, a good portion of their life as opposed to just feeling really, really good. And when you're feeling really, really good, guess what? You burn fat. When you're doing the roller coaster ride, you're burning sugar and depleting your adrenals and borrowing money from your progesterone and your testosterone, depleting reproductive function, if all this sort of makes sense. Um, so we don't want to do that. So we want to start doing, taking, and I've written a whole ebook on blood sugar, so that's something I would refer you to. Go, if you have blood sugar issues, take your blood sugar first thing in the morning, 
Make sure your numbers are below 90 milligrams per deciliter in the morning fasting. Make sure your A1C, you can get the Walmart for $9, get a little A1C tester, which is your three month average of your blood sugar. Make sure that's below 5.4, 5.3 is my favorite number um, to keep that down. Those are the numbers you want to shoot for. Read my ebook about that. That's important. Next, the adrenals, the little crazy guys are going to go borrow now from your thyroid and say, you know what? They, are the, they drive the metabolism. They determine if you're tired or happy. They put it right here in your neck because the thyroid connects with the higher and the lower center. That's why it's, I think, here. And it's very important because if that thyroid gets depleted, well, you know, you know who doesn't know someone with a thyroid condition, right? It's the most vulnerable organ to our environmental toxicity in the environment, which is partly the reason. Also, partly because we've been driving ourselves so hard, lost our connections to the rhythms. Thyroid is very much a part of keeping us connected to the rhythms of nature, the circadian light dark cycles. So the adrenals just go, hey, upregulate metabolism because we're sort of depleted here. Can we get a little metabolism going? And of course, the adrenals start to spin out, deplete themselves, and find themselves problematic. Tie that together with a toxicity issue. And now you have the adrenals, borrowing money from reproduction, blood sugar, and thyroid. And those are sort of the big three that we look at. So here again, Ayurvedically, when I look at reproductive issues, I can't say, well, it's only reproduction. That's all you have to, that's, that's just, it's isolated in that department. That department is connected to the adrenal department, to the blood sugar department, to the thyroid department, and all this stress is so intimately connected to the primary department in Ayurveda called your lymphatic system. The thyroid gland is, got, is drained by what's called the cervical lymph. And the cervical lymph is a very big drainage, drains your brain, drains your lymph. Um, it's so interesting, and I've written recently about some of the new lymphatic vessels that they're just discovering now. It's sort of uh, amazing, but uh, science is finding very subtle lymphatic vessels in the brain, uh, lymphatic vessels around the gut that they never even knew existed, that they, but they're extremely important for draining parts of the nervous system and directly linked to boosting our immunity. Some of the new science that I've been writing some articles about. So this lymph system is becoming all of a sudden even more important uh, not just something we think about only when someone has cancer in their lymph nodes or check their lymph nodes for cancer. Um, Ayurveda was, this was the very, very first system that we evaluate and trust because it's the drains in your body. Okay, so how does that affect reproduction? One of the articles that I wrote is called, It Might Not Be Hormonal. This article was about the fact that I had lots of women coming to see me who had a lot of hormonal issues and uh, and I would ask them a, history, a whole series of questions about their history. And I discovered that a lot of women have a lot of lymphatic related issues. In Ayurveda, the same channels that drain reproduction are the lymphatic channels. And that prior to menstruation, there's an internal detoxification that takes place prior to menstruation through the lymphatic channels. So, um, when you menstruate, you have this big elimination through reproductive you know, channels, but also prior to that, there's an internal detoxification taking place in the lymph. Now, if that lymphatic system is congested, then you're going to see a, a kind of an exacerbation of some of the classic lymphatic -y issues. And those are, you can feel your rings getting tight on your fingers, kind of swelling, holding on to more water, feeling more puffy. Uh, if your skin is breaking out around your jaw around that time, that's classically hormonal based, or even on the back, on your back or your chest, those are hormonal based, uh, you know, breakouts. If your, um, if your breasts become swollen or tender when you menstruate, this is your lymph system dumping into an already congested system prior to menstruation, pushing into that congested system, making the breast swell or become tender. People who have lymphatic congestion tend to have a tendency for, this, for the impurities to push into what's called the gut-associated lymph. So their belly will swell and they'll hold on to more weight. That lymph that drains your gut, it's called the gut-associated lymph, also drains reproduction. 
also drains your legs. So lots of women have extra weight in their hips and thighs and cellulite because the lymph is not draining. Eventually it leads to circulation, microcirculation issues. So these, these are sort of problems that, that, uh, that are, are well known and, and, and uh, well understood in Ayurveda. And then if this lymph system pushes, when you're pre-menstrual and this internal detoxification is taking place and you're pushing impurities into uh, that lymphatic system, it can create problems and the lymph system can swell and the breast can become tender and also push into the joints, creating a predisposition to joint concerns or arthritic changes depending on how you're predisposed. Also, it would be important to say that the, the, these impurities can move into what's called the skin associated lymphatic tissue and that's the lymph right underneath your skin. And that uh, interesting thing about the lymph is wherever you have skin, you have lymphatic vessels underneath it. The respiratory skin, the intestinal skin, this skin right here, all has lymphatic vessels with an army of immune kind of white blood cells ready to pounce on if I get bit by a mosquito, something bug, my micro bacteria might get through into my skin and I have a little army to keep it isolated in that little spot so I get red only in that one spot. That's the job of a patent lymphatic system. So if you have any of these concerns like acne or eczema or rashes or hives or skin allergies or even very, very sensitive skin or holding on to water or bloating or gas, uh, ankle swelling, rings getting tight in your fingers, tired, lethargy, joints ache, particularly when you, when you a joints pain that moves from one joint to the next is usually circulatory or lymph-based, feeling tired or extremely lethargic first thing in the morning, these are all the things. But the article I wrote called It Might Not Be Hormonal was about women who had, you know, breast swelling or tenderness and maybe chin breaking out, things like that. And they would take an herb called Mangista. Mangista, and it's in your notes. Um, it's an herb we use Ayurvedically for menstrual flow issues or for, uh, for lymphatic flow issues. And I always saw that in a very high percentage of the time, women would get significantly better. I wouldn't give them anything related to their hormones. I would just give them these lymphatic moving agents and all of a sudden they would get significantly better. Like in 70 to 80% of the time, I saw a significant, significant improvement. And I decided, you know what, I should write an article about this because it's something nobody talks about. We just think it's reproductive. Let's give bioidentical hormones or progesterone the magic bullet. Now you understand why the magic bullet progesterone actually is a magic bullet because it's basically paying back you know, the debt uh, the, the, that the adrenal uh, glands borrowed in the name of stress. So we're going to support that in a powerful way. Uh, so that is a great article you should read. It's pretty cool and I think it's great. Other lymphatic movers which are really neat to talk about. Of course water is the most important uh, lymphatic mover. Sipping hot water throughout the day every 15 minutes or so, usually for about two weeks, sort of religiously taking it every two weeks to sip more hot water, more hot water is a great strategy, a great technique to get the lymphatic system to move. I love that. Uh, bouncing, trampoline, running, exercise, moving, walking. Your, every muscle in your body has a lymphatic vessel, so when you contract your muscles, the lymph moves and the lymph pumps, and it's very, very important to stay moving. The average hunter-gatherer, you know, walked about 10 to 15 kilometers per day. So we need to do a lot better in all this research about sitting at your desk and not moving, how important it is to get up and move. Very, very important to keep your lymphatic system moving. Um, there's some really cool little uh, bicycles you can get now underneath your desk. They're really smooth, little tiny bicycles and you just pedal them while you're at your desk just to get that leg pumping because that leg will pump the lymph for the whole body. Simple things like that can make a huge difference in the, you know, if you're at a desk all day long. This is your lymph congesting, and if your lymph congesting is going to bog down reproductive flow, drainage, and then, and then intestinal function as well. So really important. Also, another herb, uh, in Ayurveda, the, the pith of the, of, of the orange and the mango and the pomegranate, all of these were loaded with these, um, these um, diosmins, which are chemicals that have actually have been shown to move lymph. Now in Ayurveda, they would take the white part, the pith of these fruits, and dry them and grind them into medicines for lymphatic drainage. And now we have actually products that Western you know, nutritional companies have figured out is something that, um, that can be used for lymphatic flow. So either go ahead and eat all the, the pith of your fruits, don't just throw that part away. I'd imagine if you were a bear, you wouldn't peel, I don't know, I've never seen a bear, bear eat an orange or anything, but I would imagine they just eat it, you know, and the pith would, they'd get it, all of it. And, uh, 
and there's amazing chemicals in the skin and now we know in the pith and so that's one way to do it. We also have a product called Lymphane HP which has a diosmin in it so if you want to get that for microcirculation and lymph um, that's um, really really important as well. So that's I think an important understanding is your lymphatic system. Yes, sometimes there are hormonal related issues for sure. And Ayurveda's perspective on that is to say, well, why don't we actually support the body with hormonal precursors as opposed to just giving the hormones first? Reproductive strength, you know, herbs to support the reproductive system, so the body can actually, you know, make this happen on its own. Herbs like Shatavari, a herb that, that means a woman with a hundred husbands, has been given to women um, when they're first in adolescence, just starting off in their menstrual, you know, career. Uh, you know, before pregnancies, after pregnancies, before menopause, after menopause, herbs that these herbs were carried women through their entire life, and something to, to think about if there is a hormonal issue. And that combined with things like lymphatic flow, that combined with supporting stress. The other herb that we use for building up uh, strength and, and paying off the debt, great herb in the winter called ashwagandha, means the strength of 10 horses. Another herb that's a, that's a uh, hormonal precursor. Um, and it's been shown to increase cortisol if the cortisol is low or decrease cortisol if the cortisol levels are high. So when I think of adrenal exhaustion, you know, I think every herbalist knows that ashwagandha is one of the most well-documented sources of rebuilding, uh, rebooting adrenal support. And what I love about it is if you take the whole herb, not the extract, you're getting all the microbes, which is part of the intelligence, you don't overrule the body's intelligence, and you also create something that actually will increase or decrease cholesterol, uh, cortisol, and not overrule the body's intelligence. Not say, well, you have too much cortisol, we're going to lower it. You have too little, we're going to raise it. This is what's beautiful about Ayurveda. It helps us work the, the ebb and the flow of nature and how to, how to live in sync with these beautiful natural cycles. Um, the other thing about the lymphatic system I think is critically important is breast health, right? Women who are, who are pregnant have more iodine in their breast tissue than they have in their thyroid. The iodine in the breast is concentrated in the breast because it's <clears throat> very important for child development, for nursing, for, for nursing mothers. So iodine is very important. Now we have an issue in our culture, we have in the last 30 years, we have, the average American has 50% less iodine in their blood than they did 50, 30 years ago. Um, and in the 20s, when they first discovered iodine deficiency, there was, you know, you know whole swaths of America that were, were called the goiter belts, where there just was no iodine in the food, and they ended up having big goiters and thyroid issues, and that's when they started putting iodine in the salt. And they put it in, and they use iodine to clean and sterilize the equipment in the meat industry, the dairy industry, and all these, uh, and it was used to clean many things. It was in the bread. Um, one slice of bread in, from 1960 to 1980, I believe it was, had the RDA of iodine in it. So we had way more iodine than we ever thought we needed. And, I, and, and many of the thyroid problems sort of disappeared, sort of interesting. Um, as a result of that, they took, they don't use it in the meat industry, the dairy industry. They, people eat uh, sea salt, which has maybe a little bit of iodine, but not like the, the, the iodine that was actually you know, put into the, the salt. Uh, it's not in the bread anymore. So we have a situation where we have much, much less iodine. Iodine in some studies, and I wrote an article called Protect Your Breasts, sh has been shown to protect the breast tissue from uptaking toxic estrogens. So you need about one to three milligrams of iodine per day. The, the RDA is 150 micrograms. So you need a little bit more than what they suggest. So that's something that you want to look at. Lots of folks are iodine sensitive. You have to be aware of that. Some people can't take that much iodine, but it's definitely some good science now to support that, that, that suggests that by taking um, uh, iodine at one to three milligrams per day, you protect yourself from breast cancer issues. So it's something very, very important to look at and read that article about protect your breast. And we do have an iodine test kit you can do at home to find out what those levels are. The other thing you have to think about when you think about female reproductive problems, that hormones are fat. So, so what about our ability to absorb fat, digest fat, deliver fat, and particularly fat-soluble vitamins, like vitamin D? Another thing, as we move into the winter, don't forget, get your vitamin D levels checked when you go to your doctor. Make sure they're between 50, 45 at the lowest uh, nanograms per milliliter, get, and between 50 to 80 is the goal. 
because when the numbers are lower in the 30s and 40s or so, the vitamin D does more vitamin type things, but it shifts to become more hormonal when it goes over 45 or 50. And it actually it comes a, is a, one of the most powerful secosteroid hormones in the body. Protects you from uh, autoimmune issues, boosts immunity, protects your heart, blood pressure, blood sugar, uh, protects you from 16 different cancers according to the research, autoimmune conditions. Um, it protects about 20,000 genes from expressing negative traits. So it's really important. It's the sun and the sun's really important. So you want to make sure that that's optimized because if that's depleted, that again, it's going to make it more difficult for us to keep our hormonal, our hormones, which are basically fat in balance, right? It's very important. And then the last thing that may be the most important thing of all is our, our, um, our inability to process fats in our system anymore. In 1961, they took fat, cholesterol, animal fat, and they put it on the nutrient concern list. So short order, food manufacturers made everything no fat, no cholesterol, fat, fat free, cholesterol free. And in 1980, Reagan, and it wasn't a bad idea, they, I don't think, at least it didn't, at the time it wasn't a bad idea, he subsidized the growth of wheat and corn for pennies on the dollar to solve poverty. And now wheat and corn, which is sugar, another source of fuel, was dirt cheap, and cholesterol, Fat, animal fats were very expensive and sort of dangerous according to the science. So the manufacturers started making everything out of sugar and wheat. And for the last 30, 40 years, we've been eating sugar, more sugar, more sugar, more sugar, and not getting enough fat in our diet. As a result of not getting the gallbladder to contract and eat a lot of fat, enough fat, the gallbladder becomes congested, the bile becomes thick and viscous, and we lose our ability to metabolize good fats but, you know, all the fat soluble vitamins, which are required for making hormones, all the, the fats we think about, good fish oils, things like that, these become more difficult for us to get, process, and deliver into our brain, to our skin, to our heart, and reproductive function for hormonal, for, for hormonal you know, function. So these are really important concerns. So if, you, if I, if I, so if you ask yourself, what happens if I eat greasy fried food, how do I feel? If I eat a really large, fatty, rich meal, how do I feel? This might be another part of the problem that's related to your inability to deliver fats to make the hormones you need to stabilize your menstrual cycle. So that's something to really look at. And of course, I've written a ton about how to reset digestive function, but I would be remiss if I didn't talk about, you know, this thing that, that is sort of our, our, uh, our an epidemic of our time is our, our desire for sugar. Uh, lots of folks are pre-diabetic. They've lost the ability to handle sugar because we overshot that runway and we don't do fats anymore. You know, hunter-gatherers, they didn't eat meat every day by any means. They ate a lot of carbs, they ate a lot of starches, they ate a lot of tubers and things like that. That's a fact. Um, but what they did do is they, they, when they did catch an animal, they would basically uh, kill it and eat all of it. And maybe they would eat a ton of fat, the intestines, everything that day, maybe not have anything for a week or so. So it's important to understand that. Science has shown us that, that when vegetarians eat red meat, they don't produce a chemist, chemical, a cancer-causing chemical called TMAO, comes as a byproduct of the carnitine that's in the meat. When meat eaters eat red meat, they, they produce this cancer-causing chemical called TMAO significantly, suggesting that if you ate meat once in a while, um, that it's actually quite safe for you, but if you eat it every day, we don't have the genetics to support that. And this is where the new science is taking us. One, re one, one study came out recently and said that about once a week is where we need to go. If you look at the centenarians in, in the world, they eat a 10%, 90% uh, plant-based diet, 10% of it is meat. So if you are a meat eater um, and you want to eat meat, then think about maximum 10% of your diet is meat. You want more protein, that's, that's fine. Get it from beans and, and nuts and seeds and things like that. But only 10% meat would be a good, smart way to go. And then you don't have the chemistry and the hormones in the meat that also affect our hormones as well. So lots and lots and lots for us to think about. Um, uh, and then there's one last topic I want to bring up before we ask some questions here, which is this thing called OGIS. OGIS in Ayurveda is what's called the physical expression of consciousness. What it is, is when you digest your food in Ayurveda thinking that it takes about 30 days for that whole process to be completed to make the most refined substance. It goes from your food, to your lymph, to your blood, to your muscle, to your fat, to your nerve, to your bone, to this reproductive tissue, sperm, ovum, and then this OGIS. It takes 30 days to make that. If you're stressed out along the way, your digestion is wacky along the way, you're doing 90 24 7, stressing yourself out along the way, barring Peter to pay Paul, you might not make this, this OGIS substance 
which um, supports immunity, vitality, energy, and something that Ayurveda really talks a lot about. So the bottom line is, in Ayurveda, is nothing in excess. Moderation is the key. Don't suppress natural urges. Lots of women, unfortunately, more than men, I think, feel uncomfortable going to the bathroom and in public places, and they hold it. And, uh, and uh, so these natural urges are, are sort of critically important to not suppress because that's that downward moving energy. And if we start blocking that flow of that downward moving energy, the same energy that makes you go to the bathroom is the same apanavata that supports uh, menstrual function and reproductive function as well. So, and if that is depleted and the lymph gets depleted and that over time becomes problematic, those toxins will default back to your liver and create more stress for your liver, compromising more of our ability to deliver and burn and, and, and uh, deliver the good fats and of course get rid of the bad fats, which are all the toxic hormones, environmental pollutants, pesticides, preservatives, all of that. So, um, and I've written lots of articles on OJA, so please go to that if you want to learn more about that. And uh, I've written a lot of articles on this, and we'll give you a list of the articles that I suggested uh, when we send you the email uh, tomorrow about how to download and, and get this uh, podcast, you know, for yourself to listen again or share with a friend. Okay, thanks for listening. Let's ask some questions here. Uh, hang on a quick sec. Let me um, get technical for a second. So first question we have here, um, what can I recommend for treating depression during and after pregnancy? What does Ayurveda say about this? It's a great question. Again, it's the same thing, right? When you deliver a baby, the apanavata is going down big time to deliver the baby. They even say, in a way, they say when you deliver a baby, it blows out your digestive fire. So the whole digestive fire has to be restarted like from scratch, like a baby's digestive fire for the mom. And the elimination is compromised, has to be restarted from scratch. Reproduction has to be restarted from scratch. In fact, they say with pregnancy and delivery, if done properly, and the care after, postpartum care after pregnancy and delivery, is so rejuvenative for women, it can be the most rejuvenating experience of a woman's life. Every single cell is considered to be rejuvenated. Now that is absolutely not the case for women in America. It's like the mother, you know, the next day they're changing diapers, going to the grocery store. It, 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 it's, this is, again, from the Ayurvedic perspective, really disrespecting this, this, this time the body needs to really heal, repair, and rejuvenate. So, again, if you deliver all that, and, and this is going to take the energy that's here, and all of it's going to go down, and uh, that can leave you vulnerable to a little bit of depression, right? Because everything's down here. Particularly if you go back and now you have to go back into your world doing 90 miles an hour, all the stuff you have here, this energy for here is gonna go back down. And eventually, when it demands to have this back to reproduce and get this energy back on track, it's gonna leave you in a major depleted state and cause a level of depression. I know what I just said has no scientific value at all, but I can talk to you about that from an adrenal perspective. If the adrenals are so depleted from delivering, carrying a baby, which they will be, and then you begin, then you go out there and push yourself even further, those adrenals will go and create more hormonal disturbances, and that's the scientific part of it. Absolutely connect, absolutely something that we understand. So rebuilding, you know, taking a week or two to rebuild from from this is very important. In, in Ayurveda, women get massages and special diets, postpartum, and I've written a bunch about that as well. And I'll write more on that if you like as well. Uh, but great question. So what do you do for that? Well, you, you, you know, ashwagandha, shatavri are great herbs to rebuild produ reproductive function. Our herb, gentle digest, to strengthen the digestive system. We have a formula called Ojas Nightly Tonic. My wife ate that for breakfast, lunch, and dinner during the latter part of her pregnancies and after pregnancy to rebuild her, her ojas. That's what that was for. Resetting digestive strength. Eating special foods from the vata balancing diet. Sweet potatoes, cooked vegetables, uh, rice and dal, kitchri, things that are super easy to digest are the way you rebuild. Not, you know, some hospitals give you a, a, a congratulatory steak dinner, which you have no digestive fire to cook after you deliver your baby. It's a little bit um, 
not connected to the Ayurvedic plan. Uh, so those kinds of things are really important, and, and, and uh, you can learn more about that. If there really is depression, herbs like bacopa, which is support, great, great support for the mood um, as well, can be important. And in B12 too, we gotta make sure that if you're a vegetarian, that that's not a piece, that's not a piece of the puzzle. Um, uh, please provide some tips on hot flashes and changing sleep patterns during menopause. Again, same thing I think I've talked about is, uh, you know, hot flashes are very interesting. The mo <laughs> when you have a, a menstrual flow that's going down and the lymph system has been congested for a long time, then you go into menopause and that lymph system has been a little on the congested side, maybe you're gaining a little bit more water weight along the way, those toxins will default back to your liver. Hot flashes tend to be more liver congestive issues than menstrual reproductive issues. So when I see hot flashes, what I do is I try to get the liver to balance. Now liver is heat, causes disturbance of sleep between 10 o'clock and two o'clock at night. Can't get to sleep because that's the pitta time of night. Again, the circadian clock. Too much heat in that clock doesn't let you sleep at that time of night. So that can become a problem. And I've, I've written about that too. I hope that's not too quick for you to understand. But the idea is that, that you wanna uh, get the liver heat out of the body. And that can be done with herbs like our liver repair, turmeric, ambalaki, even neem. These are all important herbs to do. You want to get that bile to move with our herb called beet cleanse. More beets in your diet will get everything. Even though beets are a little warming, they get things to go down. If you ever had a lot of beets or this time of year a lot of apples, you're going to be you know, eliminating like crazy. And that's downward moving energy and that gets the heat out. Babies, when they get a fever, they get diarrhea. Diarrhea is the body's way of getting rid of heat out. This time of year, as we speak right now, is the body's time to get heat out of the body. So nature harvests a whole tree of apples and beets and watermelons and leafy greens. That's why we do our big Colorado cleanse in the fall because it gets, and we use beets and greens and apples as a big part of the cleanse to flush the heat out of the body. And if that heat builds up in the liver, Depending on what time of life you're in, if it's a hormonal-based heat, you can get hot flashes. So those are some really important strategies. End of summer cooling herbs and foods are critically important for that. Uh, great questions. Um, would love to hear your thoughts about hormone replacement. Also, is shiitake good for all women that are post-menopause? Um, again, yes. We have a hormonal, a hormonal product called Hormone Free, which has shiitake and wild yam extract and uh, Vidari kind, other progesterone precursors and, and, and uh, pre precursors as well as another herb called um, Chase Tree Berry, um, which is um, Vitex, which is a natural hormonal harmonizer, which is a little bit better, I find, for women who are, who are post-menopause uh, to help support the hot flash because it has more of the progesterone support. The Shatavari is sort of a little bit better from the point of view of young, younger women who are in uh, their uh, reproductive years. Um, uh, great, great, great. And I already talked about hormone replacement a little bit is what I, my thoughts were about that. Uh, what would be an appropriate protocol for postmenopausal vaginal dryness and vaginal tissue atrophy and thinness? Well, definitely the herbs like Shatavari, ashwagandha, you know, herbs like neem to support uh, the health of your skin on the inside. I'm a big fan of three herbs for internal skin really a big fan of skin on the inside of your intestinal tract, right, reproductive tract, respiratory tract, and that is Brahmi, Amalaki, and Neem. Those three are powerful, powerful herbs for your skin. And then, of course, good, soluble fibers that are harvested now, the slimy stuff, slippery elm and, and, and uh, um, uh, um, marshmallow root and licorice root, all really great support for the tissues. You can take, we have a formula called Slippery Elm Prebiotic Formula, and those fibers are natural prebiotics. You can take that, you make this thick, viscous tea, and if you wanna soak a tampon with that, and you can actually insert that into the vagina to lubricate and soften those tissues, that's one thing you can do as well, which works really, really well. Or you can take like um, some of the massage oils, just the oil, and, uh, and mix that oil uh, into the vagina as well to lubricate those tissues. Those are some good strategies for that. How do I deal with premenstrual bleeding and bloating and weight gain? It accentuates my stress levels at a time because I'm on a healthy diet and exercise daily, so it makes me feel hopeless when I take steps back. I totally understand how you know you're doing everything right, and then this thing, this cycle, just completely throws you out of whack. And that's why I say maybe we should look at the lymphatic drainage. When you say bloat, that's got associated lymphatic bloat. 
When you say stress levels, we know stress impacts your gut. We, we didn't talk to you about this, but stress plows right through your gut, takes out your good bugs, irritates the villi of your intestinal tract, and, and compromises the, what are called the lacteals on the inside of your gut wall that affects lymphatic flow. And if that lymphatic flow is chronic over time, it's gonna affect reproductive drainage for when you menstruate, prior to menstruation. So those are real issues that we don't look at in the West. We just think, well, how do I deal with it? I can take you know, something ginkgo biloba for my stress, well, that, or, or ginseng for my stress, and that's sort of, and here's a very important thing, be careful, because a lot of times the, the adrenal fatigue agents are just stimulants in disguise, and you're just taking something to stimulate your adrenals to make more energy, so you feel better, but you've borrowed in the process more money you know, from Peter to pay Paul, and you end up yourself further into debt. Where things like ashwagandha and shatavari, these are actually ogis building herbs. They're really gentle. They don't stimulate you. You can take them in the morning for energy before you go to bed for sleep. They don't overrule the intelligence of your body. I can't emphasize that enough. I don't even have stimulants in my practice or sedatives. I don't use them because we always try to support function. And that is not required unless you're actually, you know, using medicines try to really, you know, kind of overrule the body's intelligence. And sometimes that's needed, don't get me wrong. Um, I feel faint in the days before I menstruate. What is this about? Again, if you think about it from the perspective of menstrual flow, upward and downward moving prana, the prana that goes down, if that's, you know, barring Peter and needing a lot more energy, this energy that's going to go up is going to be depleted to go down and support that. And that will leave you nobody home here. Sometimes cause faint, emotional disturbance, breakout, tiredness, lethargy, fatigue. That's some of the things that can, that can happen. Uh, what is the Ayurvedic philosophy on why one in four pregnancies end in miscarriage? Um, you know, it's a, a great question, and, and I would encourage you to read the article that I talked about today in, um, about what my wife's experience with miscarriage. Um, and how all the things I talked about today, the exhaustion, the not living, you know, connecting to the rhythms of the nature, we can teach our daughters how to take time a little bit during, you know, training our kids to go inward, teach them how to meditate, how to become restorative yoga during that time. These are the things that, that, that happened years, years, years before, you know, the miscarriages that can support function. Definitely making sure you deliver fats, your fat-soluble vitamins are important. Uh, your essential fatty acids, you know, are, are very, very important to actually deliver these hormones. And I think the biggest thing, though, is stress. You know, stress is really critical. Progesterone is a great immune suppressor. And progesterone stays up during the first part of pregnancy to suppress the body's immune system from turning against this fetus. And if progesterone has been taken away by all the stress for too long and there's low progesterone levels, you're not going to have the, you're not going to have the immune um, suppressing that you need, and the body can sometimes turn on the pregnancy. That was the story that I wrote about in today's article, so go read about that. But that's a big thing, and again, that just falls back on the stress-progesterone relationship, which I think is fascinating and something that, that we should all know about when we're trying, we're trying to navigate these problems. Uh, what's the best remedy for sagging skin? Uh, youthfulness would probably be the answer to that. Um, this is the most disturbing effect that accompanies hormonal change. I love Ayurveda. I'm currently uh, benefiting from Shatavari, but wonder about bioidentical hormones can assist me more effectively. Maybe they can add to it. But also, you've got to remember, your vi here's an interesting thing. Vitamin D levels um, are, are epidemically low in a lot of people. I think it was last time I saw a study, it was 87% of the American population were deficient in vitamin D. That's probably better now because the words out that it's good for you. But very few people actually optimize your levels between 50 and 80 milligrams per deciliter. And here's the interesting thing. When vitamin D comes from the sun, which you don't get in the winter, it goes through your skin, goes to your liver, goes to your kidneys, becomes active. And then from there, it feeds all the organs in your body. Guess what organ is the last one to get vitamin D? Yep, your skin. So the skin, which sags quickly, uh, becomes the last organ. So a new study came out and said you can actually put Vitamin D on your skin directly, topically, and it'll absorb right through your skin. So maybe not a bad idea. And actually, I have vitamin D in all of my skincare products, our Ayurvedic skincare line, because of this research, that if you put a little bit of vitamin D in your skincare product, we have a liquid-based vitamin D, put a few drops in your lotions or creams, and then rub that onto your skin directly, you get that vitamin D, which you probably isn't getting there since it's the last leaf on the tree to get the vitamin D, it's pretty of a sneaky way to deliver it directly to your skin. There's good science behind that. So that's one thing to do. 
the shatavri, I might think about doing something more along the lines of the hormone free, which has the, the Vidari kind and the wild yam and the Vitex, a little bit more well rounded formula for postmenopause. And yeah, if really needed, bioidentical hormones, but I gosh, I have a hard time thinking about bioidentical hormones just for cosmetic reasons when there's so much we can do for the skin internally, that being one of them. And remember, if your skin on the outside is looking so, not so wonderful, we got to think about healing the skin on the inside. And that's a uh, I've written a bunch about that, thinking about you know how to support digestive function, health of your skin, the, how to reboot probiotic, permanent residence is also critical. During pregnancy, is Ayurveda helpful? And uh, uh, what precautions can be kept? Uh, must be kept in mind. Um, there's really good st studies about how epigenetically. What you see, what you experience in the world, you become. Um, and so that's really important for us to realize that what women expose themselves to during pregnancy is impacting the baby, for sure. And that's something that uh, Ayurveda is really all about, is taking time and being what's called sattvic, loving, kind, giving, joyful, not expose yourself to violence or stress. Well, the, the, the husband's job is to make the woman completely happy, take care of every single need, as crazy as it might be. The husband's job is to make her feel completely fulfilled, expanded, so she feels safe and secure, so that baby feels safe and secure. And when babies are safe and secure, we now know, we have the scientists suggest that the microbes inside of you proliferate in a positive way. They evolve faster, better, quicker. When, when we are under a lot of stress, our good microbes, you know, um, disappear and we lose them. So we want to, during pregnancy, provide a, a, a microbiome platform for the most positive microbes, which are 90% of the cells in the human body, uh, as we possibly can. So that uh, hopefully uh, makes good sense. It is now 6.35. I went five minutes over. I want to sort of officially and the call. So if you have to run, I want to respect your time. Thank you for listening. Uh, um, I'm going to continue to answer some questions. I'm going to actually shift over to the phones right now. Anybody who has a question, please push uh, star two and I'll answer some questions. And I've got uh, a couple more verbal questions while you guys are pressing star two. If you want to raise your hand, let me know. There's see some, um, some controversy about taking iodine blindly. How can I be sure I have a deficiency before supplementing? Do we need iodide as well? Yes, you need iodide and iodine. Iodide uptakes into certain tissues in the body, iodine into other tissues in the body, so you need both. There are iodine receptors in every single cell of your body, so you need both of them. Yes, I am not a big believer of taking huge amounts of iodine. The iodine pill that I carry is iodine uh, HP. It's got 12 milligrams of iodine in it. On average, I tell people to take it one pill every one or two weeks. The idea is that if you were eating lobster, you would eat a ton of iodine and then nothing. Sort of like meat, eat a ton of it and then nothing. Give your body a break. But I don't suggest taking 12 milligrams a day unless you're under doctor's supervision. Um, I always, we have an iodine test kit, which is one of the state-of-the-art test kits. You take an iodine pill and you urinate in this very large, very beautiful, discreet, bright orange bucket you carry around for a day and then, then that determines how much iodine you actually uptake it or eliminate it, and that determines whether you actually need it or not. And I, and I, and I am a high, a big believer in that test before you start knowing exactly how much iodine that you need. Uh, it is water soluble for most folks; it's harmless, but um, I think it's. But but um, you definitely want to have a good sense that you need it. You know, one milligram a day um, is probably a good way to be for most folks. Uh, do women who take birth control upset the natural cycle in their body? It's a very good question. Um, definitely it affects the hormones and the ability for your body to do it. I have had many women who get off their birth control and reset into a natural rhythm beautifully. Sometimes it takes a little doing, but it's very, very doable. I, I, I am not a huge believer in birth control for the long haul. I think we need to get you know, better ways of birth control, and if you're using birth control for skin issues, I think there's better ways to go. Let me switch over here to, um, to the phone. Um, okay, so here we are. Um, so uh, here's one from Kansas. Are you there? I am. Yeah, hi. Um, just to, I, I have two questions you mentioned about excess bile in the liver. 
Um, I'm just wondering ways to clean out excess bile. Well, um, it's not excess bile. Generally speaking, the liver becomes congested and the bile becomes thicker and more viscous. And it, therefore, it can't move easily through the common bile duct. And that common bile duct gets connects up with the pancreatic duct with all of our digestive enzymes. And when, those two, when that duct gets congested, it blocks the pancreatic duct and the bile flow. So now you can't digest much of anything. So you want to decongest those bile ducts. And that's why I'm a big fan of beets this time of the year, celery, uh, apples, radishes, uh, artichokes are all really great. Lemons are really great bile movers, really, really important, but I, and, I, and I love using those. Beet salads, apples, all that is great this time of year. We have a formula with called beet cleanse, which has beets in it, fenugreek, um, cinnamon, and shieldjit, sort of herbs to sort of rotor rooter out the bile ducts and clean them out. Um, so those are some of the things that I would use to decongest the bile ducts. Okay, great. And then just one more question. Um, uh, the last time I menstruated, I, my first day, I just bleed like a drop, literally a drop, and then the rest of the day I have major cramps, so I don't bleed at all. And then the second day it's normal. Do you have any thoughts on what would, could cause that? You know, sometimes when, when, when women have major cramps, you know, I always wonder, is that because we didn't do a good enough job on the pre-menstrual cleanse? From ovulation to the time you, the onset of menstruation, there's an internal lymphatic drainage that's taking place. And was that, you know, that's what I would look at. Is that really working well? How do I feel in those days? And, it, and it, are there other signs in my system of lymphatic congestion, history of allergies, hives, eczema, bloating, holding on to water, things like that? And if I see some lymphatic issues, then I would say, ah, oh, let's clean that out. Maybe take Magista for a month, see if that gets you to clean out. So then when you start, you don't have to either have a super heavy flow or a super crampy you know, cycle. That makes sense? Mm, it does, thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for the call. Um, so I'm going to go back. I'll answer a couple more questions here. Um, how can I find my rhythm without the lunar, with the lunar cycle after a hysterectomy and now menopause? Um, that's a great question. I, um, I have no idea how you would do that, except to, you know, I think that the only suggestion that I would suggest is how can you find your cycle if you had a hysterectomy and now in menopause, what do you do? I definitely think those cycles are definitely there. And I think that, you know, if you were to create that eye of the hurricane, that calm, and establish yourself in that calm, then I think that you start to appreciate that. Maybe it's around the full moon or the new moon or whatever, but I think that you would become more sensitive and more self-aware. You know, sort of like that question I always like to ask, how do the birds know when to fly south? How do they go all meet and gather and then hit up one tree and then gone, they're gone? How do they know? What, what is the, what rhythm of nature are they following? And how do they figure that out? And I think that we have that ability, of course, and that's part of our circadian rhythms that uh, we just, you know, haven't tuned into those cycles as much as we could. So I, I don't know the right, the exact answer, but I would say keep trying to tune in. Um, What's your take on bioidentical hormones instead of HRT? Again, definitely bioidentical is way better than HRT, traditional HRT. Uh, you know, again, I, I don't think the, I think the best strategy is to try to get the body to do it itself first, and then if need be, then do it. And if you do it, try to do it for a short period of time. That's, uh, that's my um, suggestion. Um, is there a natural way to prevent early onset of puberty? Um, well, you know, we have six kids, three girls, and I think that um, very, we were very, very aware of the amount of hormonal-based products that they ingested. You know, meats, milk, dairy, cheese, you know, so much hormone in our meat to get chickens and things like that that are not organic that um, uh, can, be really, can be real problematic. So I think that's probably a, a good topic for us to end on is you know, when we're raising our kids, really it makes a difference to, to shop organic and feed your children organic because those hormones, you know, I, we don't, I haven't seen any science suggesting that's the reason why they, they, women and girls are starting so early. But I had three girls and we did raise them organic and mostly vegetarian 
and uh, they all started, you know, sort of normal even to a little on the later side. So I think, uh, at least from my personal experience, which is completely not scientific, um, that is um, what our experience was. So I would definitely look at that first, and, and maybe a good place for me to dig in and do some research. And I will. I'll look into that, see if I can find some science about that, because that's a great, great topic. Anyway, I want to thank you all for joining me. I'm sorry I didn't get to all your questions. I, I will try to take a look at them and, uh, and answer them the best I can after the call. Uh, and and uh, usually we have some notes that go out, so we'll try to make sure some questions if they haven't. A lot of the questions have, I've already answered, so we'll try to make sure we get everybody's questions answered in the notes that we send out tomorrow and the link to download in the podcast. Thank you for listening, and uh, we'll see you hopefully next month when we talk about child development.